What do Falcons do? Rise up. Welcome to Rise Up Reactions, the show where we talk all things Falcons, NFL, Georgia sports, and in general, the sports news of the day. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Denning, the Golden Hard Doc. And guys, we are now post-draft. It is Sunday after the draft. All the rounds have been completed. Um, I want to be very clear. As a Falcons fan, we have seen a major divide. If you go to any message board for the Falcons, you go to Twitter, you go to Facebook, you go to Instagram, you go anywhere that there's a Falcons group, there has been almost a civil war going on about the pick made at number eight with B. John Robinson, and then with some of our other picks as well. I think it's important to recognize something. We are all Falcons fans at the end of the day, and we all are there to support each other. There is zero need to get really aggressive and be on this live or die on these hill moments within Falcons Nation. I think that's part of the reason that we don't have an intimidating atmosphere at the stadium is that Falcons fans in general are kind of behaving poorly towards each other in these environments. But I think we can do better with each other. And I think while we can be very hopeful for the future of our team, especially in light of some of these picks, I think some of them are very good. Uh, I think the talent that we got is very good at certain positions. But again, I think we can be, we can also be critical of our team, of what we think should have happened as well, without this devolving into some sort of absolute nightmare of a debate on online. I just feel like we are better people than that. So with that in mind, let's go through the draft real quick and talk about what the Falcons have done. Now, number one overall, we've taken B. John Robinson at number eight. I personally do not think that a team should take a running back unless they are like one player away from getting to a Super Bowl. I, I just don't think you need to take that in the first round, especially if you have gaping holes at other needs. Bijan Robinson himself, phenomenal player. Let's just talk about him real quick. Uh, two years ago, 2020, 87 carries, 705 yards, average 8.1 yards per carry. Had four touchdowns. He's had about uh, had 15 receptions. Uh, 196 receiving yards. 2021, he only got better. He played in 10 games, 195 attempts, 1,127 yards, 5.8 yards per carry, 11 touchdowns, and 26 receptions on 31 targets. And then in 2022, he did the yeoman's work for the Texans, uh, or sorry, for the Longhorns. Played all 12 games, uh, 257 attempts, 1,575 yards in just those 12 games, 6.1 yards per carry. Uh, he had 18 touchdowns, 19 receptions on 29 targets, uh, 314 yards altogether. He has been consistently, by PFF, take it with a grain of salt, but he's consistently been graded above 75, finishing 95.3 for a running back this past year. In looking at individual games against tough competition with Alabama, he had a 66.1 grade, which is pretty solid. Uh, he had above 80 in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 games, which is actually, sorry, 8 games, which is still pretty good overall. Um, so definitely a guy who is probably the best running back in the draft. I just don't know if we should have taken him there. Now, other guys that kind of fell to that point, Jalen Carter, defensive interior for Georgia. Apparently it's coming out now that the Georgia staff was not speaking highly of Jalen, and that may have influenced the Falcons' decision. But my thing is this. Chicago Bears went with a tackle to protect uh, to protect their quarterback um, in Justin Fields. That means that we probably could have traded with the Philadelphia Eagles, who were at 10 at the time, traded, gotten extra picks in the middle, maybe the third or the fourth round, which would have been beneficial to us going forward. As there was a ton of talent that just slipped to the third and fourth round in this draft. And that's something that I think we could have done better on recognizing uh, from a front office staff. I think Terry Fontenot is going to have to have his uh, his ear to the ground a little bit better on, on teams that may want to move up. Uh, and he may have to have a better poker face with players that have, quote, unquote, um, you know, questionable character uh, in the sense of Jalen Carter, you know, just so that we keep our cards tight to the chest and make other teams interested in those picks in the future. I'm hopeful that we're not picking in the top 10 for several years to come, though, unless we make some sort of trade. Now, with that in mind, again, guys that I think we could have taken that were also there, I think we could have taken Jalen Carter at defensive interior. I think we could have taken uh, Peter Skaronsky at tackle, maybe had him play guard for a little bit, but be the heir apparent to Jake Matthews. I think we could have taken Luke Van Ness, who we were certainly high on and fits the Ryan Nielsen prototypical um, edge rusher, even though he may not be that high of a grade. Broderick Jones at tackle was available. Uh, Christian Gonzalez at corner was still available at that point in time. Kalijah Cansey, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, who wanted to take another wide receiver to get that wide receiver too. However, what I will say about Bijan. 
With Bijan coming in, I personally think Tyler Algier has earned starting rights to start the season. I think they will ultimately be a 1A, 1B combo punch where they both are seeing somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of the snaps each. Uh, it just depends on how well we end up getting Bijan Robinson as a pass blocker by the end of it. Um, that's going to be a big, big determinant for him. Uh, I think we have certainly established ourselves as a run-first team going forward, and we could have that same type of production as, say, uh, or same type of look as the Tennessee Titans have in years past with uh, King Henry there at running back. We now have a King Henry-esque running back uh, that we have taken in the first round. But again, Tyler Algier uh, should be the starter to start the season with Bijan Robinson not far behind. I just think it, it would be incredibly poor protocol to take away uh, Tyler Algier's shot to start after the crazy productive year that he had for us even when he didn't basically start hardly any games or didn't play much in the first half of the season and then still break the uh, break the rookie rushing record for the Falcons so with that in mind I think B. John Robinson is going to be an amazing Falcon I think we can be critical of other players that were taken around him that probably would have been more core pieces of our team for a longer period of time the NFL just does not value running back moving on we have the second round selection I thought this was a crazy surprise moving up and taking Matthew Bergeron we traded away our 100 110th pick and our 44th overall pick to the Indianapolis Colts uh, in order to move up here. I think it was a little bit of a uh, a, a little bit of a of a miscue by the staff. Now Bergeron. He's probably a pretty good player overall. He started out in 2020. He did not have a good year with Syracuse. Had a 53.5 grade. He played 666 offensive snaps, which that just is a terrible number anyway. He played a lot of pass block and not as much run block in his second, uh, or sorry, in his uh, 2021 season. He was graded 74.6, playing pretty well overall, playing 12 games, was pretty much healthy. 784 snaps, 406 run block snaps, and uh, 378 pass block snaps. He allowed one sack last uh, in 2021. Allowed one, uh, sorry, nine hurries and one QB hit last year. Not as good of a year overall. He played 11 games, 686 total snaps. Pretty even split on running and passing. He did allow five sacks uh, and he allowed four hits on the quarterback with three hurries. The teams that he struggled against included Purdue, Clemson, and FSU, which are all a little bit uh, better talent. However, you had Notre Dame and Pitt, who he played incredible against. Uh, and then let's see here, not a mo- not a lot else. Just looking at PFFs uh, really quickly. Um, but things that he is going to be good at, uh, he is probably going to be more of a swing tackle role for, to start with. He'll be playing left guard for sure. Uh, we'll t- see what he ends up doing for us. He could end up being the heir apparent to Jake Matthews. But again, he's not a guy that I think we would have had to move up for. Just looking at who was taken immediately after him. You had Jonathan Mingo, who I would have loved to have had at wide receiver two. You had Isaiah Foskey, defensive end. You had B.J. Ojolari, uh, linebacker slash edge rusher, Luke Musgrave, tight end. And then Joe Tippin, center, taken. There were not any more offensive lineman taken until pick 48. So I don't know that you needed to move up to take him. And you gave up 110th pick overall, which obviously there was some talent that fell based on the Clark Phillips pick. So while Bergeron may end up being a great pick, PFF had him on the big board at 65. He was consistently graded at that turn of round two, round three by pretty much everybody. And I just don't know that he is a guy that we needed to trade up for. He is six foot five, 318 pounds. He's going to be a solid guard for, for us to start with. He at least is going to get a chance to start there. Uh, but I just don't know that I love this pick. But moving on, we went into the third round, and we got a guy that I think is a little bit of a project, but also could be amazing for us. You had Zach Harrison of Ohio State. And just going back and watching some of his highlights from the 2022 season, this man was a sack machine. He was a hurry machine. He had moves to get around the tackle. He was finding ways to get to the quarterback a lot. He is more of the prototypical build that we look for with Ryan Nielsen defenses. Six foot five, two hundred and seventy-four pounds. He is only going to be twenty twenty-two, so he's going to be fairly young. Uh, he is going to be uh, more of a two-down edge rusher. Uh, he could be an impact edge rusher for us pretty quick out of the box. Could give AK forty-seven and Lorenzo Carter a run for their money. He is incredibly raw, but I don't know that he is going to be 
a day one starter for us. He's probably going to sit behind or at least you know maybe a rotational component for a little while. But if he gets going with Caden Ellis also there at linebacker, he could be an amazing player for us. But I don't know if he's going to line, line up on the right or the left. Uh, so far, Lorenzo's been doing a lot of left side lineups and AK-47 on the right. So we'll see where he ends up going. I imagine it'll be more of a rotational component with uh, Arnold Epicady, AK-47 there. But again, I do like this pick a lot. I'm surprised that he fell there overall. Uh, PFF graded him as a fourth rounder, but having watched him play against Georgia in the semifinal game, he just looked like a beast uh, on that defensive line, and it was crazy to see how much pressure he was putting on us, even with our phenomenal offensive players there. So I do like this pick for us, even though some people are calling it a reach. Uh, then we move into the fourth round, and this is the steal of the draft for us. We got Clark Phillips the third. Clark Phillips the third has been a great player. Um, uh, a great player for several years in the NFL. Or sorry, in the NFL. Uh, great player at Utah. Um, he has this past year passer ratings. Uh, uh, the passer rating he allowed was sixty eight point four. He played uh, twelve games. Defensive snap six hundred twenty. He was mostly coverage in three eighty five. Uh, he allowed 41 receptions on 66 targets, 511 yards. He did allow four touchdowns, but had six interceptions. So he is a freaking freaking ball hawk. Uh, he was a solid player, ended up getting uh, a lot of accolades for the Pac-12 this past season. And I think that he is the steal of the draft force. He was consistently projected as a second round star, uh, second round guy by PFF by a lot of other teams, and we got him at 113 overall in the fourth round. So I really do like this move. But again, I would have liked to have had another pick here because the foul, uh, not the Falcons, the Indianapolis Colts ended up taking a guy that I absolutely loved here. They ended up taking, um, oh, I can't say his name. Uh, Adetomawa Adebaware. I'm not sure if that's right, but he played, that was an edge rusher that had been given second round grading in both the Senior Bowl and the Combine, and he fell all the way there. And again, it doesn't hurt to have more edge, uh, edge depth, and he's a guy that I think we could have taken there. I really liked him overall. Um, you had a few other guys there. You had Dewan Jones at tackle if you wanted to go there. Uh, you ended up having Roshan Johnson, who was consistently uh, a running back that was projected to go in the fourth round had we not taken B. John Robinson. Uh, and again, I just think we could have made some better moves, but obviously the Falcons are high on Bijan. They're high on the guys that they took, but we gave up a fifth round pick, so we knew we weren't going to get that. Uh, and we did more or less, we're going to call that a selection for Jeff Okuda, which I don't know if you can get any better on upside for a fifth round pick than Jeff Okuda. We didn't have a sixth round. I wish we could have traded into the sixth round with our two seventh round picks, but coming out with the two seventh round picks, we picked back to back in 224 and 225. And the guys we took, one of them I actually, I think, mocked to us uh, in DeMarco Hellams out of Alabama, who has just been a pretty solid player overall. He's nothing to write home about. He's been a uh, rotational component for him rather than a starter. But in his uh, starts with him, he played 13 games last year, 903 defensive snaps overall. He played a lot of run defense, but he also played some coverage snaps as well. Uh, he had 84 tackles, uh, 23 assisted tackles. Uh, he only had 12 missed tackles last year. And again, he's six foot one, two 203 pounds. He played, he'll be 23 starting the season. Uh, overall, played pretty well. Don't have a lot to say about him overall. And then we come back with Javon Gwynn, who I think is a little bit of a weird one here. I mean, at the seventh round, you're just taking flyers. So obviously, he had a great meeting with uh, the Falcons at some point uh, out of South Carolina. So, you know, in keeping with tradition, we basically didn't draft any players from the SEC until after the fifth or sixth round. Um, I don't know why the Falcons are not pulling from the pool of SEC players that they get to see on a weekly basis in the regional television here. These are the best players in the country, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of guys going into the league. Um, so I don't know why the Falcons have an aversion to taking guys from the SEC, but it just seems like, and again, can't, can't 100% say, but that just seems like they have an aversion to it, particularly an aversion to Georgia players. Um, but again, Javon Gwynn mm, played 840 offensive snaps. He allowed two sacks, uh, seven hits, 10 hurries last year. He's been a consistent player for South Carolina, but I don't know if he's anything to write home about. He's been playing right guard a lot. So he's a guy that will compete, 
uh, with, um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name from last year, but one of the guys that we have in the practice squad for reps. Uh, but again, I think there's guys that were higher rated here, like Andrew Voorhees, who went just a few picks later out of the Pac-12 of the USC, who certainly had a higher grade, like a fourth or fifth round grade here. Uh, and again, I don't know that this was our best pick, but it's the pick that we ended up making. Uh we ended up trading away our uh, seventh round, 245th pick uh, to the New England Patriots. I don't even know what we got back for that at this point in time. But, guys, I am very hopeful for the future. I think, again, it's important to realize we can be critical of what the team did. We are armchair GMs, and we all have been playing the mock draft game. We've been having opinions on these players for weeks to months now. And, again, it just depends on what you're looking for, or what the GM is trying to put together, what vision he has for the team. As far as the seventh-rounders go, these guys barely ever make the roster, so I am fine taking flyers on these guys. It does not hurt to have depth at safety, and it doesn't hurt to have depth at guard. I think we made some really good moves with our four uh, significant picks in the draft. Um, I think, again, we can be critical of what we did with those picks as well, with number one overall and particularly in uh, at pick eight. Um I think we probably could have traded back and still gotten some of the guys that would have made our team better and, again, built up draft capital either now or in the future. Um, but that's just what I think. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Please consider subscribing. I am really trying to get to that 500 subscriber mark by the end of the 2023 season. For those of you who are expecting me to do a live draft um, or a, uh, a, a Facebook or a YouTube live for the draft, I certainly apologize to you guys. Uh, YouTube has this fun thing where they do not allow you to do a live anything for 24 hours until after you hit that button. I had no idea whatsoever that that was a thing. Uh, but again, just ended up doing it on Facebook Live just rapidly. I only found out like an hour before the draft that I couldn't do that. And I didn't, and I already had plans on day two and day three where, that were not going to allow me to do it uh, there where I could live stream it. But again, for those of you who did join me on Facebook, thank you so much. For those of you who would like to subscribe and consider supporting the channel, it would really mean the world to me. We're at 126 right now. We've got a little ways to go to get to that 500 mark. If we can get to 1,000, that's even better. But guys, thank you for watching. And as always... Rise up.